the Spiritual Brew Pub Podcast. We'll help you navigate spiritually after or during a belief shift, deconstruction, or crisis of faith. Not to try to convert you to a particular destination, but give you the resources you need to evaluate your future belief or unbelief and help you follow the religious historical evidence wherever it leads. I'm your host, Michael Camp, a recovering conservative evangelical, the operative word being recovering, sharing my journey and helping others rebuild faith or a reasoned philosophy of life. So grab your brew of choice and learn how fact-based history helps us both critique and rethink faith. Why do we call it a brew pub? Because we like to hang out in them, at least metaphorically. A pub is a great place to let your hair down, share your true thoughts about your journey, and discuss things with an open mind in a non-judgmental environment. Welcome, everyone, to the Spiritual Brew Pub. I'm your host, Michael Camp, and I'm very honored to have on the podcast Dylan Neighbor Cruz. Dylan is an author, a veteran, and someone who has gone from U.S. Marine to aspirational pacifist. His latest book is Theological Musings, Collected Essays of a Tattooed Theologian. Dylan, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Michael. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited about uh, the conversation we're going to have today. Um, I first heard of you, uh, and I think it was either Nat Turney's or Jason Alum's podcast, and uh, I was very fascinated with your story, especially how you came to rethink um, our American obsession with trying to solve global problems with military solutions and also the other side, believing retribution is necessary to resolve uh, evil in the world. And that's kind of right up my alley. So <laughs> I recently wrote a book called Breaking Bad Faith that exposes um, violence and violent narratives in our, uh, in our popular theology uh, and in our American culture. And uh, the book also deals with how to flip that and how to do, uh, create a new paradigm of restoration and peace. So your journey really resonates with me, and I'm looking forward to hearing your take on it. Um, and also uh, dealing with the dehumanization of people that we'll get into. So uh, we'll get into all this in due time, but first let's start by hearing about your background. Um, what's your story? How did you come to be a fundamentalist Christian? You deconstructed that and became uh, an aspirational pacifist or a peace-seeking Jesus follower. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep this as brief as I know, possible. And, and um, sorry about that. You could probably go a whole hour, but let's just get I, the I could. Notes version. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I had Church of Christ grandparents, very conservative uh, when I was growing up. And then, um, so we spent a lot of time in the summertime going to, you know, revival meetings and stuff with them. Then I moved to a town called Blue Ridge, Texas, uh, just before my 12th birthday. And the first people that showed up at our new home were the uh, secretary of the First Baptist Church in Blue Ridge and her daughter inviting us to church. The next thing you know, I was getting saved and baptized as a Southern Baptist. Uh, anybody that knows about the Southern Baptist knows that it's fundamentalist, it's white, it's uh, slaveholder religion. And so between the very conservative Church of Christ and the very conservative, uh, very white Southern Baptist, I was enmeshed uh, for the, from like the age of nine until my early 30s in fundamentalist culture. Um, 2003, I was an undergraduate student at that time, and my wife at the time was a chaplain in the Army. After I got out of the Marine Corps, she joined the Army, became a chaplain. And as, as a result of my undergraduate history studies, I started to make some connections that were really beginning the beginnings of unraveling the fundamentalism and not only the fundamentalism, but the Americanized fundamentalism yes, that puts right. America on a pedestal as this shining mm -hmm. beacon of hope mm -hmm. and democracy in the world. And 
literally everything I believed, my whole worldview started to crumble because I started taking history classes for my history degree. And during the 2003 build up to the Iraq war, I started paying a lot more attention to the words in red. And I remember being in a chapel service uh, at a military chapel on, on the island of Oahu, where my then wife was the lead chaplain. And everybody was praying for a quick, victorious war. And right. not one single person, myself included, even though in my head I was going, why do we have to have a war at all? I wasn't seeing Matthew 5, 9 anywhere. And right. I, I eventually walked out. And um, I didn't go back to another church on my own volition. And that was in the team. And that was in your early 30s, you said? Or yeah, my early 30s. Right, right. Okay. So you got out of the church before, and, you're, and relatively young, but you started very early at nine years old. So there's a yeah. lot of indoctrination that goes on when you're a kid. So, you know, yes. that's very similar to, I mean, it just reminds me of some, some of my experiences. Um, and you could probably resonate with this. When I first got, quote, saved in an yeah. American Baptist, a Northern Baptist church, um, uh, I read the gospels for the first time and mm -hmm. I was blown away and I walked away as a pacifist. I thought, Oh, well, you gotta be a pacifist. If you follow Jesus, it was yeah. just so obvious to me. <laughs> I had no, yeah. I had no real indoctrination in this, it, you know, one way or the other, I just read it. And then I realized in the next few months, I realized no one in my church was a pacifist. No one in the evangelical movement was a pacifist. No one. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so they kept telling me, oh, no, Michael, you have, you can't do that because, you know, that was just they make excuses for Matthew five. They, you know, that was just uh, right. he wasn't talking about governments. Now he was only talking about individuals and all this stuff. And so you you end up saying, well, I guess who am I to question this at the time? So I just thought, OK. And then later on, you you get smarter as you learn more things. But it sounds like you went through that experience after you had been a fundamentalist. You figured, hey, this is this is not it's a cognitive dissonance that's going on. But what, yes. what else? Yeah. But you also had some experiences in your childhood. that were kind of traumatic. I mean, what was your child look childhood like? Well, if you've ever read Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt, he starts off the book by saying an ordinary childhood is hardly worth your while. And you know, I read that book many okay. times and it resonated with me because I didn't have what you would call an ideal childhood. Uh, I, I nearly died at nine months old with spinal meningitis. Oh, and wow. Then, then things went downhill from there. Uh, um, oh, so, man. you know, broken home, uh, abuse, physical abuse, neglect, uh, being made the scapegoat in my own family, uh, all of those kind of things led to complex PTSD. And I didn't know I had it. Um, yeah, right. And, and as a result of my childhood and youth, and also as a result of that conservative fundamentalist Christian culture, uh, I, I ended up joining the Marine Corps when I was 17 and, you know, I had oh. to get my parents, to, my mom to sign oh. a form saying that I could go right. to the, the processing station and take my physical and take the oath and all that before I turned 18. And it was in 2009 that my sister told me that she was really pissed off at me uh, for leaving in 1990 and joining the Marine Corps. And she goes, I know exactly why you did it. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she goes, well, you were running away from what we grew up in. And I was like, yeah. oh, Oh, wow. Okay. My sister nailed it. I didn't realize that, but that's exactly right. what right. happened. And, you know, I, so I joined the Marine Corps with PTSD, but wow. didn't know it. But then yeah. while I was in the Marine Corps, I was right. in a very bad accident uh, one day while on a training mission. And there are two kinds of PTSD. There's complex PTSD from right. longstanding, uh, you know, toxic stress and abuse and that kind of stuff. And then there's so-called simple PTSD that happens from a one-off event. So in the PTSD lottery, I won, I got them both, um, <laughs> which, which can make life really, really difficult at times. Um, I imagine. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. I mean, um, I mean, some, some of us can never, some people just can't imagine what this is like. I, um, 
but I, I have an inkling. I mean, I, I didn't get into the Hall of Fame of PTSD for, by any means, but my first counselor when I was clinically depressed after I was starting to deconstruct evangelicalism mm -hmm. said I had PTSD. He said, oh, you have the symptoms of PTSD. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't go to Vietnam. What's going on? <laughs> right, know? yeah. And, we, and people didn't realize that there is such a thing, and sometimes people call it religious trauma syndrome. And mm -hmm. But the other thing is that you, you mentioned there's complex and then there's simple PTSD, and most people don't realize that, that right. the complex, as you said, it's an ongoing thing is, you know, it's like, it's like, it's not, it's not just like one event, but maybe a string of smaller events that all add up. Is that what you're saying? Yes. It, it, it's protracted over time. So right. in my own situation, there was heavy handed physical punishment. There was religious trauma by being told that if I died at nine years old, I would burn in hell forever. Oh if I didn't gosh. say the magic prayer. Oh uh, there was some <laughs> way too early sexualization and probably sexual abuse that is uh -huh. yeah. really hidden in my mind that um, right. I'm still working through. Right. And then there was the emotional uh, neglect and and being made the scapegoat. All of those things are toxic and stressful. And I have a very sensitive kind of personality anyway. So those things were really hard on me. And then you add in um, the Marine Corps experience, which just added to that. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. But um, uh, I mean, I guess the big question is, <clears throat> you know, what help did you get to overcome this or start to deal or cope with PTSD? What have you, what, what has been hopeful for you in this? Well, the primary thing is that I learned that the things that I was taught were sins because I would have anger issues or doubt or depression or anxiety. All of those were seen as sins in the Southern Baptist sort of world. Right. They're actually symptoms. <laughs> and yeah. when I finally got diagnosed in 2009, my the psychologist looked at me and said, Dylan, I am absolutely amazed that you're not face down in a gutter with a rusty needle sticking out of your arm. I was like, the hell are you talking about? And he goes, most people with your story, that's where they end up. Oh, my gosh. And I was like, wow. OK, I thought that this was just life. This is just what happened to me. So it's quote unquote normal. And I found out that that shit's not normal. Yeah, um, right. Abuse and neglect are not normal. Uh, religious trauma is not normal. Uh, those are not healthy experiences. So that was very helpful. And then once I got diagnosed, I, I eventually was directed to the VA, to the Veterans Administration, which sometimes gets a bad rap and sometimes I'm still pissed off at the VA because, you know, months can go by without care yeah. for certain things. But I've been consistently in therapy uh, with the same therapist at the VA on, on an almost weekly basis since 2015. And prior oh, wow. to that, I had, a, yeah. I had a therapist when I lived in Hawaii again for a couple of years. So I'm working on a memoir very slowly because writing about PTSD is pretty difficult. Um, yeah, it and is. it's called Traumatic Episodes, Finding Grace in a Life Lived with PTSD. And one of the biggest pieces of grace is, is learning about the trauma, learning that these things are not my fault yes. and that, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's hard, hard work right. to go through trauma therapy um, and sometimes leads to me having days where I don't do anything other than just try to get through the day because my my PTSD changed brain needs some rest. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, a couple of things strike me, you, you know, it's like uh, your neuro pathways or something are just, are just like trying to protect you or whatever. So you're, you, you probably have some, uh, something maybe that triggers it, triggers mm -hmm. remembering th something. And then now your 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 body is trying to it goes into a protection stage, but it's not a painful. It's not a safe. You don't feel safe. You're you know you feel no, like you're you there don't. again, right? You feel like you're back to where you're almost back to where you were, like something like that. Yeah, and, and it's different for different people. For me, yeah. it's a very it's a very somatic and visceral experience. I have something right. called aphantasia, so I don't see a lot of visual pictures in my head, but right. I'll 
my body reacts. And there's a book called right. body, The Body Keeps the Score that's really well known in trauma right. uh, circles. Um, and it's because trauma is stored in your body. And when something triggers that, uh, you can relive it in a way, either visually, emotionally, spirit, you know, what have yeah. you. I, I just want to bring up a real quick point. It's become very popular on social media to throw around the word triggered in a very mm -hmm. trivializing way or to say, I got PTSD from watching the Phillies lose the World Series. No, you didn't. No, oh, no, 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 no. I see what you And you're here, saying. here's what triggered looks like. Right. I can't function. My body is moving all over the place. I have to right. be in a dark space. I'm rocking yeah. back and forth. There yeah. is nothing trivial about this. Right. So people, point. please don't do that. Yeah, right. Yeah, not not to trivial, trivialize uh, it like, oh, yeah, that yeah, we all understand that. But no, you're talking about something at a very different level. Yes. And I think triggering is a thing, but it's not oh, <laughs> it is. trivialized. <laughs> yes, it is right. absolutely a thing. I had an yeah. EMDR appointment this week, and I was very triggered by listing all the traumas that I've been through. And oh, it took man. a licensed clinical social worker 45 minutes wow. to talk me into a place where I was able to leave the room and then drive home. Wow, that's amazing. Well, yeah. I'm we're really glad that you got the therapy that you need and you're still in it and that's fine. People need to realize that therapy is perfectly normal and, and absolutely and necessary for many of us. Uh, I mean, I just remember when I went through my clinical depression, um, I, I used to say, you know, I used to think, you know, Oh, how can anyone, you know, I don't know, commit suicide or harm themselves. How can they do that? Then when you go through that experience, you go, Oh, now I get it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. You think just like, Oh, wait a minute. We're, we're looking at this wrong. And you mentioned like, you know, someone said, oh, you, you know, most people would be in the gutter with a needle in their in their arm. And then you, we have to have empathy for people who are in those kinds of situations. A drug addict. I mean, it's not that every drug addict is like that, but there's always something behind in the background that molds a person to react to things and to do self-harm or, or getting to, to ad addiction or whatever it is. So I yeah. think that's a really important lesson for us to have empathy and try to understand what people have gone through. And then we can really have compassion on them. Yeah. So, um, um, the other um, thing I want to get into is that you also had some PTSD from your uh, boot. I think it was your boot camp or military experience. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I went to boot camp 11 days after Saddam invaded Kuwait. Mm -hmm. So in 1990, so my boot camp experience uh, was at a time of active war, which made the drill instructors act in a very particular way. They were preparing us. So this was they, was this what year was this? 1990. Oh, 1990. Okay, all right. Yeah. The, so the this Gulf was yeah. you know the for the full first Gulf War. So they they had a yeah. very particular lens. Marine Corps boot camp is three months long. It is toxic stress the whole way. That sort of added to the morass of complicated traumatic episodes of my life. But it was in 1993. I was on the big island of Hawaii. We were doing uh, our annual or by, uh, twice a year. The, unit, the brigade would go from Oahu to the big island and conduct military training exercises. And my brigade was part of that. And I was crushed in a piece of heavy equipment from the chest down while working and doing some maintenance. Um, and both of my legs, uh, the pressure popped my thighs. That's oh my the, really the only way to. And I hyperextended my right knee in such a way that it bent backwards. And then they had to push it up like this. So oh I God. tore my ACL, popped both of my thighs and ended up with another kind of PTSD from that. And then in the aftermath of that, my unit didn't take the injury seriously. My really? commanding officer said that somebody, that two people got hurt, one of them sprained his ankle, and that looks like the worst injury of the two. Well, no, I, I, I had your ankle. Hurt. Oh my God. Yeah. And I got PTSD. So, um, and it took 11 months 
of cajoling to try to get me an MRI even. And, really? Uh, oh yeah. My gosh. And, <laughs> and so I, I had a promotion that was held up. I so got, you were still serving after this accident? Oh, yeah. I Not only was I serving, I ran PT sometimes twice a day with a torn ACL. Oh, I did God. forced road marches of uh, between 15 and 20 miles wearing a full pack with a torn yeah, ACL. Yeah, it begs the question, maybe that made it wor worse and in injured it more. Well, they treated me like I was malingering. Right. And, and they treated me like a, a, a problem child. So all of that really shaped my final year in the Marine Corps. And, um, you know, it, it's hard to talk about. I'm yeah, probably going to yeah. spend the rest of the day processing this conversation after oh, no. this. But, well, we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll pivot but, here. But that's, and that's, you know, that's, that's okay. Yeah, but, right. um, but, but those were, experiences were very difficult for right. sure. The, the other thing I, before we pivot here, um, the other thing I wanted to have you share with people so they understand was you write about a kind of a dehumanization process in, in boot camp. Yes. And how yeah, they, absolutely. how they, how they train you train young recruits. People don't naturally kill each other. Right. So you have to be right. trained to do it. So what was that like? One of the things that my mom and her husband asked me right before I was going to sign the papers was, what happens if you have to go into combat and kill somebody? And right. I was 17 and just very blase and was like, well, better them than me. Right. Yeah, you know, right. and, and you go in with this sort of patriotic attitude that we're always right. We're always right. The United States of America and, and right. our violence is good violence and everybody else's violence is bad violence. And that's the myth of redemptive violence that people like Walter Wink talk about, and Michael Harden right. talk about and stuff like that. Right, right. But one of the first things I heard when um, when training began was one of the drill instructors had instructed his platoon. We had to climb a 30 foot rope at the end of the obstacle course. When I mm -hmm. look at the obstacle course pictures today, I'm like, how the hell did I do that? But right. every every recruit does this crazy obstacle course. And then when you climb the top of the rope, you'd hit the, the cross beam and you would mm -hmm. yell a slogan. Mm -hmm. And this guy's chosen slogan was kill the ragheads, bury them in the sand. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. right away, we've got racist dehumanization, which then makes it easier for them to be killed because they're subhuman and bury them in the sand. Well, right. that's exactly what uh, Schwarzkopf ordered uh, with bulldozers and whatnot in the first Gulf War. He had lot living people buried alive with oh heavy God. equipment. Yeah, he, Schwarzkopf is a war criminal. Oh right? my gosh. But, so the entirety of the Marine Corps boot camp experience is learning to dehumanize Mm -hmm. And the first general order of the Marine Corps is to locate, close with, and destroy my enemy. This is so radically unlike Jesus that it, it's a miracle to me that any Christian serves in the armed forces these days. And we don't go back to the first three to 500 years of the church where Christians didn't serve in the military at all. Right. Because of the whole, as you mentioned, when you read the Gospels, if you sit down and read the Gospels, and you start at Mark and you read all the way through Mark and then you go through Matthew and you read yeah. without stopping and you come away with anything other than Jesus was a pacifist, then your reading comprehension skills aren't very good. Right. No, it's true. But, right. No, but it's the, very the dehumanization <laughs> takes place for the entire three months. And then you go to something called Marine combat training, which every Marine goes through, whether you're a, a pencil pusher or a heavy equipment operator like I was or a, or a ground pounder grunt. And you learn to kill people. And those are the enemy other. And anytime you enemy other somebody, you've stripped them of their humanity. And that's the only way we can train to kill. No, that's true. I mean, I, I, I go into that in a lot of detail in Breaking Bad Faith. And it's and it's true. And I'll just throw out this one interesting uh, fact. Um, it, it's not natural for people to kill. Obviously, they have to be trained. You have to be cajoled, you know. Yes. brainwashed programmed right and we 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 watch these films on and movies on television or t streaming 
and on, on the theater in the theater and it's like we we just think oh yeah yeah james bond is killing people all over the place it's a piece of cake right you know it's just not right. like that you know <laughs> yeah so you there was a study, your brain to do it. yeah there was a study of of our american wars uh by several people i'll just very briefly say this it's really fascinating and they found out that in the um uh revolutionary war and in the civil war only a very small percentage of soldiers were actually firing their weapons mm-hmm. during a battle. And in like Gettysburg, they found, I don't know, a huge percentage of weapons that weren't even fired at all. The whole, you know, they, I, they could pick up a weapon and then they can figure out, Hey, this wasn't even fired. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, they, um, they determined that, well, wait a minute, what, why is this? And the military start, decided, Oh, we have to, and even in world war II, this was the case. And so they had, we have to, we have to do better training to get people to, <laughs> to fight more. And mm-hmm. so that's when they started. And, and I don't know if it was in the Korean war or the, it was definitely the Vietnam era. They started changing boot camp to be, to train people to kill more. And then the, the percentage of shooting went way up in the, in the Vietnam war. And it's been like that ever since, I assume. So that's, yeah, really that doesn't surprise me at all. Doesn't surprise you. Right. So that's that's really interesting um uh okay let's pivot a little bit but i mean just just one other thing here you write in your book that uh you know you kind of cringe inward inwardly when people say thank you for your service when they find out you're a veteran and that's yeah. because of all the things you were just saying well it's it's not only that um yep. it's it's what the military is used for mm-hmm now, from a historical standpoint, the the continental United States has not been invaded since 1812. Yeah. So, but we have an almost $900 billion defense budget now. And we have military bases all over the world. And these things serve one thing. Capitalism. That's it. This is about money and power and resource control. And if you hear the words American interest, you can almost guarantee that it has something to do with somebody's profit margin or uh, some aspect of geopolitical control. So my service, anyone's service, isn't in service of freedom. That's propaganda. That's just straight up propaganda, like the show 24 or any kind of, you know, raw, raw, go team, go military movie that you see. Those are propaganda films. That's what we're serving. So I cringe inwardly because people don't know. They, they feel like they're saying something nice to me. Right. But what they don't realize is that I didn't, I was a very minor cog in a very capitalistic war machine. Right. And I would, I would highly recommend everybody go read uh, about Smedley Butler, who was a Marine for 33 years. He was a general. He was the most decorated Marine in the history of the Marine Corps when he retired and then when he got out, he said, I was a gangster for capitalism and war is a racket. It's about profits and control. And people tried to do a coup during one of the, pre- I think it was during Hoover's presidency to make him a military dictator. And he's like, nope, not doing that because I don't believe in that anymore. Um, so right. look up Smedley Butler. Smedley Butler. Okay. He was a general. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Major General Smedley. And he, and he has a book, I assume. Uh, it was called War is a Racket. It was like a, a pamphlet. Yeah, okay, it's War a, is a Racket. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, No, but this is um fascinating and and sad at the same time because it's – Yes. Uh, we, we just – we're just indoctrinated with, you know, all the, the commercials uh, for, you know, joining the army or the Marines or <laughs> mm-hmm. all this stuff. You, I, you know, now I look at those commercials and go, Oh my gosh, this is just, they're not, they're just, you know, they're, they're whitewashing everything as if it's, it, it's, it looks like a totally different thing. I mean, I imagine they do that when they re- try to recruit people too, but. It oh, absolutely. Seems, yeah. It just seems like they're saying one thing and then there's a bait and switch at some point. When you get in there, I mean, is that a fair uh, statement? <laughs> yeah, I I used to refer to military recruiters as used car salesmen in spiffy uniforms. Okay, 
<laughs> All right. Well, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, well, you know, I always say veterans are the ones that can tell us this better than anyone else. So, you know, uh, this this is just incredible. We we all need to learn this, though. So let's pivot a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. At one point you said uh, in your book, Christianity doesn't get more fundamental than loving our neighbors. Um, so, you know, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you, you know, um, why do you think that is what matters most in Christianity and and the teachings of Jesus? Well, because that's what the text says. <laughs> I mean, he in in Matthew 7, 12, where the golden rule is found, he prefaces that with in everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And then he ends it with, and this is the entire law and the prophets. So for Jesus, the entirety of his scriptural canon was boiled down into that one statement. Right. And, and it's found, you know, it's, uh, it's found in the other gospels too, but it's, it's most known from Matthew seven twelve, 12, uh, or at least for me. And then in Luke 10, 25 through 37, that's where the lawyer is trying to catch Jesus out by saying, who's my neighbor. Right. And in that example that Jesus gives, right. he, Jesus says, well, here's a, here's a story about a Samaritan and Samaritans to the ancient Jews were like African-Americans to people like Bull Connor in Alabama in the fifties. They, they didn't like each other. They hated each other. They had different right. viewpoints of where the holy sites should be, etc. So there was a lot of enmity and animosity between the two groups. And Jesus flips that all on its head by showing that it's the Samaritan who shows the love of neighbor. Right. And in that whole passage, he said, this is the most important commandment to love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. And by using the Samaritan as the neighbor, he's overturning centuries of mutual enmity. And then he says, so who, who showed the compassion and love? And the scribe's like, oh, damn, <laughs> it was the Samaritan. <laughs> well, he couldn't even say did... Samaritan, the one who, yeah, he's the like, one who showed him mercy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the one who showed him mercy. And he's like, right. okay, go and do likewise. Right. And my, my New Testament professor, Dr. Greg Carey, said we all have a canon within a canon. Mm -hmm. I think Jesus had a canon within a canon with his, you have heard it said, but I say this right. kinds of statements and where he would overturn some of the more legalistic uh, laws in the Torah in favor of treating human beings well. Mm -hmm. And my canon within a canon has, has long been the golden rule and the love of neighbor because I think they encompass all of Jesus's theological teachings. And that it, it would be really radical if we literally follow that in everything that you do. So right. in no, your voting true. booth time and in your, you know, international relations, uh, in your interpersonal relations, you know, between governments and all of that kind of thing that would radically reorder society and the world. No, no, it's amazing. Um, I call that what matters most in my writings. And mm -hmm. um, I think the, the root of that, in my mind, is that people are taught the infallibility of the Bible. So they're, right. they're, they're taught to try to harmonize everything you read in the Bible. And so Jesus is contradicting <laughs> parts of the Torah and the writings. And, mm -hmm. uh, the, we, and people are, are taught not to acknowledge that. And if you can't acknowledge that, then you're forced to saying, yes, but, you know, sometimes God right. does endorse violence. <laughs> right. And, and then Jesus' teachings are just are just become irrelevant. And I frankly, I think that's what's happening today. It's just more and more Jesus' teachings become irrelevant because people are trapped in this paradigm of looking at the Bible a certain way. It's like worshiping the Bible, really. And oh, yeah. lose the sight of what matters absolutely the most, not only the most, as Jesus said, that is the entirety of the law and the prophets. That is the law and the prophets. So it's it's just amazing to me how this happens. Um, but but you're really right on with with 
with the love ethic. I call it the love ethic. Um, mm -hmm. If we did, if we really did, uh, church wouldn't matter. Um, you know, how you view the Bible wouldn't matter. All kinds of things in the religion we call Christianity would not matter. I mean, yeah. And it wouldn't really be a religion in my mind. <laughs> well, in our contemporary time, you see the the Christian nationalists and the really conservative Christians pushing back against pastors preaching from the Sermon on the Mount. I know. Like, I Why are you preaching this woke nonsense? And it's like, I, I couldn't believe this it is when Jesus. I read that. Right. This no. is Jesus. And it's really changed. When I first got in the evangelical movement in the in the 80s, early 80s, I got I got into it in 1979. I just dated myself, but <laughs> it wasn't it was bad, but it wasn't that bad. It's just gotten worse, you know. Right. Um, right. It's just like that now they're going so far as to say, oh, well, that's just woke theology, you know, whatever. What do you mean? This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus. And this is why you, you claim you're a Christian. <laughs> it's like I don't get it. I just scratch. I'd scratch my head when I when people do mental gymnastics like that to turn things around. So, yeah. Um, how about how did you become what you call an aspirational pacifist, and 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 what's that all about? Well, my my time in the Marine Corps uh, definitely contributed to that. I I was very fortunate in that I did not see combat, and I think that would have probably broken me to be honest uh to have been in combat situations that and the study of history really and then looking at starting to take the words in red seriously so it was a combination of things and again if you can read the words in red and come out thinking that jesus is pro-war or that there's anything like just war theory that goes back to Augustine and then in the right. 20th century to Reinhold Niebuhr, he was, you know, I say he was so cynical that he was bordering on nihilistic um, because of his whole just war kind of stance and, mm -hmm. and Christian realism. Uh, that was his thing. And that you have to have some warfare um, to, to be a, to be in a modern nation state context. And right, I, right. I don't see that anywhere. I, and if you're going to say that the Bible is the same for all times and all places, then where is this coming from? Right. And, and just this morning I was reading um, something on Palestinian nonviolent resistance. And one of the, I, I, I don't know if they were historians or sociologists or, or whatever, the different scholars that were, um, referenced in the in the article uh showed that nonviolent resistance was twice as effective as violent resistance wow so wow. in that context it was 53 percent of nonviolent resistance was effective and only 26 percent of violent resistance was effective and then in seminary i read the work of walter wink um, yeah. in engaging the powers this is a whole series of books, but this is the last one, Engaging mm -hmm. the Powers. Mm -hmm. um, it's fantastic. It's it's one of the finest books I've ever read in any genre. Um, before I went to seminary, I read The Jesus Driven Life by Michael Harden. Right. Yep. And that kind of cemented what I had already been thinking about in terms of pacifism uh, as being the call, that that's what Jesus said that we were to do and then there was another book called the nonviolent atonement by a mennonite scholar named j denny weaver okay. and and basically in that book he's like if you're going to say that jesus is the incarnation as it says in the gospel of john then you have to look at his life and teachings to see that god is actually nonviolent. so if there's violence in the bible that's humans right but Jesus shows us the nonviolent way. And so he was radically against anything like penal substitution atonement because it's a violent uh, kind yeah. of theory. Right, right. And it, 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 it actually makes God out to be violent. He can't forgive unless someone unless he, unless is somebody, tortured and murdered. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. And and if you look at the, the narrative of the resurrection, 
or, or the crucifixion and resurrection. Well, on the cross, we're told that Jesus says, forgive them. Yeah, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're right. doing. They're doing. Yeah. Right. And then, and you know, previous to that, Satan had said, you know, it says in the scriptures that if you even stub your toe, legions of angels could come down and start wiping people out. Right. Right. And Jesus is like, yeah, no, that's not how this is going to work. Right. And then when he's resurrected, the first thing he says to his disciples is peace. shalom. Yeah, peace. So he doesn't come back and going, all right, y'all. You screwed up now and then just go wiping out people or like when peter was like do you want us to call fire down from heaven exactly. because they didn't listen to our message and jesus is like have you been listening to me at all <laughs> yeah you know so basically everything in and and it doesn't matter what you believe about the divinity of jesus or whether the resurrection is a literal historical fact or not if you read the narratives yeah non-retribution non-violent resistance to power to empire is his whole thing right his whole theological thing yeah so yeah. those all of those things inform me now and if you look at what happens when somebody says my violence is good and your violence is bad then you end up with a situation like we have in the middle east right now right or in places like Sudan and South Sudan or any place where there is maybe even um, understandable violent resistance because people have put, had their backs pushed against the wall so much and they just can't take any more. But what do we have to do to break that chain yeah. of events? Right. And, and even outside the Christian tradition, the, the Buddhist tradition has the bodhisattvas and they, they will take on the karma of, of violence so that other people don't have to experience it. Oh, if I'm, okay. you know. um, so there's, there's nonviolence in other traditions as well. And I know that even an eye for an eye, that whole thing in the, in the Torah, was meant to stop exponential violence if i understand the, the theologians and scholars that i've read correctly oh yeah that's true it was like um um uh, you know that you could find some places where people were taking revenge 70 times or something i think it's right yeah lamech was 70 times seven right. and so like basically that. they were saying okay no just eye for eye make it equal right and and thinking yeah. oh this is a very just thing and then Jesus comes along and goes, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's no, not let's good. not even do that. Let's not do, yeah, we can't do that. And and we ignore it. It's just amazing. Yeah. And but so, I will yeah, say, I, I've never been pushed to the limit the way, uh, say, the enslaved in the American South were. Or the people in the Gaza Strip have been since forever, you know, decades and decades, decades yeah. uh, or in the West Bank, uh, or maybe the, the people um, under the subjugation of the British Empire, right. and that kind of thing. That's why I say I'm aspirationally pacifist. Yeah, let's like, unpack that. What does that mean? Well, one of the things that my therapist tells me a lot is we're terrible emotional predictors. We we don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. until we're in the moment. And she says right. that because the trauma, the traumatized brain often thinks that there's something terrible is about to happen, right? The next shoe's yeah. going to drop, the next trauma is going to happen or whatever. Right. So we don't know for sure until we're in that moment. I don't know for sure that I would have the mental and emotional strength to not respond with my Marine Corps training as long ago and as old as I am now at 51, I'm not as spry as I used to be, but I don't know. I hope that I could stand in the same kind of place that the disciples stood in when they, and the early church people that were persecuted by say Pliny, the, uh, the younger and Marcus Aurelius and some of the other um, 
Roman officials that were throughout the empire when early Christianity, early the early Christian movement was like, now we're not going to worship the emperor. We're not going to eat food sacrificed to idols. And right. Rome was cracking down. And some of them were like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Every time they asked, yes, I'm a Christian. And well, we're going to beat you or kill you. Okay, I'm going to go to my reward then. And Bart Ehrman talks about one of the things that's so compelling about Christianity is that the early church believed so much in the resurrection of Jesus and in the power of that event and in his nonviolent teachings that they were literally willing to and often did die yeah. for those teachings. Now, aspirationally, I hope I could live in that place. I've heard Bono, uh, the lead singer of U2, say, there's no glory in killing for the revolution. Dying, perhaps, but there's no glory in the killing. Right. And I, and that's how I see it. No, no, that makes sense to me. Um you know, but, you know, uh, I consider myself a pacifist, too. And I like your phrase aspirational because it's very true. We um, we hope we in theory and in practice when we um, when we can, we're always suggesting restorative solutions rather than retributive. We're always pointing to the fact that actually violence doesn't work. And we can see it through history. I mean, it's I, I go that through that in my book. I mean, you know, when you bomb the crap out of someone, <laughs> all you do is create new grievances <laughs> mm -hmm. that will, yeah. people will resort to violence. Some some of them, not all of them, but some of them will. And it's just it's just the way work human nature is. So it's right. it's just crazy. Um, so uh, it doesn't work. But on the other hand what would we do? I mean, how would we, you know, how would we react if someone had a gun to our head and said, you know, if you don't do this, I'm going to shoot you or whatever the, the situation is, or, you know, you're in such, you're oppressed so much. It's just, you know, out of this world and you're, you just, you just react. So we get all that. And, and I think most people don't understand is that, when someone does commit a violent act, we always think, oh, let's make this a binary thing. Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Very simple. But it's much more complex than that. So when Hamas attacked, we we want to, it was horrendous. It was a terrible, we can condemn it, but let's not be so naive to think, oh, it's simply a binary thing. They're evil right. and Israel is 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 pure as a driven snow when you unpack things you realize that's just not true so i mean uh i don't know what what are your thoughts on what's going on there now well <clears throat> it's something that i've that i've only really recently started to to try to dig deeper into the the longer history of things right. and and i will admit that the thing that much of what i've read comes from a sort of pro-Palestinian lens in that it talks about the occupied territories uh, in a way that shows that the media coverage is often heavily skewed towards Israel and right. the Israeli government and that what's happening in Palestine is that these are radical terrorists and it kind of conflates all uh, Palestinians with Hamas, which is which is absolute nonsense. And if if you look at the numbers of deaths, and it's and it is one hundred percent. I want everybody to understand that Hamas is a terrorist organization, and what happened on October seventh, though it did not happen in a vacuum, that is not the way to do things. Absolutely. Killing yeah. twelve hundred, or I think it was twelve hundred, or maybe mm -hmm. seventeen hundred innocent civilian people. Yeah is not the way to go about things. But then you see, and and the pattern that I've seen in the literature that I've read is that typically what happens, even in the face of nonviolent Palestinian resistance, of which there has been a lot well-documented, but it's not apparently as well-known in the West, that despite that nonviolent resistance, Israel has often attacked and been very disproportionate in their use of violence. So we now have almost 19,000 
people in Gaza that have been killed uh, in the air and the air assault mm-hmm. and the ground assault compared to the 1,200 uh, that were on October 7th. And that's a pattern that seemingly has been taking place for decades. It has, yeah. And yeah. there's an intractability on the side of the really hard right politicians like Netanyahu, uh, Itzhak Rabin, and people like that from the past, that if you can't move, if you can't recognize that both groups of people have been there and have ancestral roots there, and that no one group of people has 100%, this is only our land, then it's going to make it incredibly difficult. And I think my hope and prayer is that a two-state solution somehow happens, but I don't think that that can happen with Netanyahu. And I, I'm not sure how to say it. Likud. Yeah, right. No, I, no, those guys, yeah. Those people are, are not compromising. They no, won't even not. get back what they illegally annexed from 19, the 1967. I know, war. I know, no. Um, so it's deeply complicated and it's horrifically tragic because... Right. Hamas and Hezbollah are apparently their whole thing is wipe Israel off the map. Well, that's just as intractable and awful as saying that only Jews have a right to be in this land. And by any means necessary, we're going to make that happen. Right. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely complex. And um, I think, one of the things that helped me is uh, if you if you read history of of the whole history of every uh, of the whole conflict starting in even before 1948, but mm-hmm. you'll 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 you start to get oh I I see it's not so one sided as I thought it was, and you right. start to see you know Israel um, the state of his nation state of Israel has and the IDF has done you know, just as much violence, more so and <laughs> than than the the the, the terrorists on, on the Palestinian side. So it, it it's a cycle of violence. If you uh, listen to people like Chris Hedges, a war correspondent who uh, was in Gaza for seven years and served in all kinds of wars and stuff, people like that, people like uh, Ilan Pape, an Israeli historian, People like uh, Norman Finkelstein, uh, a Jewish political scientist. People, uh, uh, and there's there's several others. You'll you'll mm-hmm. just see that it becomes clear that we cannot look at this uh, conflict in a very binary way. It has you have to unpack it, or else it, the cycles of violence just go on and on, and and uh, it's it's just tragic. But. Um, what about the solutions? Because people are always saying, well, what else are we going to do? You know, this is what 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 does restorative justice look like? What would be a better way, a, a Jesus way of handling these con- even world conflicts or local conflicts? I mean, that's a million dollar question. And if I had if I had the, the great answer to that, I'd, I'd, I'd win the Nobel. But you Prize. have a couple of examples that I think. Yeah, sure. With. Yeah, I think I think one of the things is that I touched on it earlier. Post-resurrection, Jesus did not come through and start retrip, a, 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 a process of re- retribution. He right. initiated Shalom right away. I think that there are people on both sides of the the Israeli Jews or or and, and Jews in the diaspora and Arabs uh, and Palestinians uh, both in Palestine and throughout the Arab world that don't believe that violence is the way to make this uh, right to fix this those yeah, voices there, need to be amplified yeah they, there are some peaceful has been some peaceful protests on the Palestinian side yeah yeah. Um, and and the article I was reading uh, this morning uh, outlined decades of peaceful, nonviolent, mm-hmm. civil uh, disobedience um, in, in, on the part of Palestinians. Another thing that we need to do is we need to make 
fundamentalist Christians understand that the modern nation state of Israel is not mentioned in the Bible anywhere. This is not going precipitating Armageddon as a war in the Middle East is not biblical. That's an end times fever dream that is not supported by biblical scholarship about the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. uh, other apocalyptic literature that, that is, I mean, you've, you had that whole left behind series right, and right. all these end times prophets right. talking about these things. And that's made up stuff. They're trying to create a self-fulfilling prophecy by generating a war in the Middle East. And these are bad faith actors and they are not helping the situation. Those people do not care about Jews as a people. They think that this is going to bring Jesus back. And I've got news for them. That's not how that works. The kingdom of God is at hand. We have to live into it right now. It's not some future thing where, you know, the rapture and Bart Ehrman has a really good video on, on this. Um, my new Testament, uh, professor, his whole area of expertise is on apocalyptic literature in particular of the book of revelation. It's about the Roman empire and how Christians are supposed to live and respond to a violent empire. Right. It is not about the 21st century and what's happening now, but there are major players in our government and in governments around the world who are fundamentalist leaning Christians who are manipulating this situation, just like Netanyahu did, because he apparently knew about these uh, planned attacks and did nothing so that he could respond in, in the way that Israel is responding. Uh, that's apparently well documented now. So yeah. the bad faith actors need to be pushed to the periphery and the people who really want to live harmoniously need to have their voices uplifted. I don't know how that happens because we have so much uh, propaganda. You can't even criticize the war now without being called anti-Semitic. I know. Well, yeah. what, what about the Jewish people who are critis critical? I know you bring up Jewish people who are doing the same thing and they say, well, they're not real Jewish people or whatever. They just, right. <laughs> It's the same and, uh, dehumanizing. I mean, just like, oh, well, they, they don't count. It's <laughs> right. They don't count. And and one of my very dearest and longest standing friends is Jewish. And he and I had a very frank conversation just a couple of weeks ago. And he said, look, what's happening is genocide. And this is wrong. Yeah. But the flip side of that for him is that so many Jews have this innate feeling in their heart that they are connected to that geographical location. And I get that. I'm sure that native uh, indigenous, you know, native Americans all over the North American landscape have that kind of feeling in their right. heart, this longing for that yeah. place where they come from. And I think that that's almost certainly the case for the Arabic peoples who have lived there for hundreds and or however long, you know, that they've been there. There has to be a way to create a peaceful two state solution. We've been to the moon. We've created the Internet. Human beings have done astonishing things technologically, medically, scientifically, etc. So I think that we're intelligent enough to do this without genocide on either side right i wish i knew what the answer was though yeah no the, for that one it's it's a tough one but um really i mean to set to, to, to put it simply uh there needs to be uh, equality for for both sides in a in a in a secular de democratic state and i think the the problem is that that some people just don't want to live together and they claim they do. Uh, they want to live together with the Arabs, but they just don't. And, and, yeah. some of the, and on the other side, the, you know, they others want to drive Israel completely out. But there have been uh, 
times when the Palestinians did acknowledge the right of Israel to exist, and they were almost mm -hmm. they almost got there a few times. They got got really yeah. close, and it broke down. And and so I mean, people are always pointing the finger. Well, it's their fault. It's not our fault. It's their fault. And people have to get past that and really, in my mind, start taking teachings like Jesus seriously. Love your enemy. Put yourself in their shoes. And then mm -hmm. maybe you can find enough common ground to move forward. So um, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, we, we're running out of time, but, um, you know, in our country with the way that evangelicalism and Christianity has changed so much, what do you think is the difference between really following Jesus the way we've been talking about and his love ethic and and what most Americans today claim to be who claim to be Christians, what they actually believe. I mean, we there's what has Christianity become today in America? That why how how has that happened? And and how do we get people back to looking back at Jesus again in this way we're we're describing? Well, I I think that there there are a lot of historical events and viewpoints that have led us to this this point uh far too much of american christianity is authoritarian and i think a lot of that goes back to white supremacy at the nation's founding and european christians feeling that their whiteness and their europeanness their quote unquote civilization made them in, innately and inherently better than people of color and that, you know, the doctrine of discovery uh, from the Pope, the Treaty of Tordesillas, I think that's the one that sort of bifurcated uh, the New World um, and allowed Portugal and Spain to start divvying things up. The conflation of Christianity with empire that happened way yeah. back uh, in the annals of time, fourth century, all of those things have played into it. And then you have these the fun, the various fundamentalist movements the great awakening in the late 19th century centering on conversion experiences and a very narrow reading of scripture i think all of those play into it and then we have this civic religion that is now known as christian nationalism that's been going on since the late 1800s i've been doing a fair amount of reading on this recently uh because there are Christ christian nationalists in my county that are trying to take over various government entities yeah uh, from the county commissioners to school uh board people and judges and the, and the whole bit um and i think one of the things that i that was really powerful when i was in seminary is we learned to read the bible in a way that's not devotional not picking verses out of context. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. Well, I, I can do all things through a verse lifted out of context, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and and my professor, uh, Dr. Carey, said, you know, sit down, read the Gospel of Luke. And he picked Luke for a particular reason. And he said, start at chapter 1, verse 1, and don't stop until you get to the last verse. And that shows you a more cohesive narrative of what the writer of that gospel was trying to say about Jesus. And if you do that with, with any of the gospels or any of the prophets, you can start to see a clearer picture. And it's a lot harder to misrepresent the collection of texts that way when you contextualize them in their social milieu and in the land and the world that they were living in and all of that, it makes it a lot harder to be authoritarian because there was nothing about Jesus that was authoritarian. The last shall be first. Satan took him to the highest mountaintop and said, I'll give you authority all over the, uh, the whole world. And he's like, yeah, right. nah, that's not, that's not what I'm about. Yeah. Right. And I think that one of the things, reconciliation, 
and meaningful work towards dismantling the systems of oppression. Uh, like what happened in Germany post-World War II when they reckoned with what Germany had become under the Nazi party. Or like what happened in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa post-apartheid. Right. Right. I think those kinds of things need to happen in the United States between for indigenous Americans, African Americans, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, because all those groups have all been abused, misused, and maligned by white supremacy throughout right. throughout American history. I think the same thing would need to happen in uh, in Gaza, in Palestine, Israel. People have to be aware of the humanity of the other person, the other group. And only by restoring that, I understand that you are a human being just like me, just trying to get through life. Exactly. Um, you know, as the Buddha say, the, the Buddha in me sees the Buddha in you. Uh, the human in me sees the human in you. Uh, and I think that starts with white people. I think that starts with people like you and me because we've been the dominant force and held up as this idea of what's quote unquote normal and what's quote unquote good. And we need to deconstruct whiteness as part of our theology. And we also right. need to have a theology that's trauma informed, which is why I mentioned the whole thing about being triggered and how we should yeah. not trivialize that. Right. Because there's such a thing as generational trauma mm -hmm. and African-American communities carry that generational trauma in the United States. Native American communities carry that generational trauma. Asian American communities, all of the people of color and the LGBTQIA community in this country have all been dehumanized and we need to, and that's all, of that even the sexuality part is under the umbrella of whiteness and heteronormativity and those things need to be deconstructed and that starts with me i've been on that journey for a number of years now and it has to be top down as well so it's a bottom-up top-down reconfiguring of society that eliminates whiteness as a construct and that doesn't mean that white people are inherently bad, but what's been done in the name of whiteness and white supremacy is. And so until yeah, and we it, get to that, yeah. we won't get to the to the relational theology of the love ethic, as you call it. Right. Yeah. And it's really um empire. I mean, it's whoever's got control, whoever has the power, and you know, it just happens to be white. There were mm -hmm. um you know, there were there was a time in ancient times where white people would enslave white people. <laughs> so, right. Right. So but if we when you understand history, you realize, oh, OK, actually, it's it's a problem for for, for the whole human race. But we mm -hmm. have what we have today because of who was in power. And, right. And 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 the po the powerful, the empire uh, needs to stop dehumanizing the other like you said, and start to realize that we're all the same. And, and otherwise it, the oppression just, it just goes on and the oppressor becomes the oppressed. I mean, the oppressed mm -hmm. becomes the oppressor <laughs> and the cycles of violence. One more point I want to make before we close was, and I think this would be a good um, illustration of what we're trying to, we're driving at is the response that we had as a country after nine 11 and the war on terror Right. Mm -hmm. It was a response in the belief of redemptive violence that if yes. heck we got attacked, if we just to go ahead and attack our enemies and destroy who did this, that will solve the problem. That's what uh, Hamas wants to do. That's what Israel mm -hmm. wants to do. It's redemptive violence. Right. So why is that wrong? What what do we have to get right in that? Well, as, as Walter Wink points out, that's, that is like a foundational myth for humanity. It goes way back to the 
ancient Near East, the story of Tiamat and Mark, uh, Marduk. And it, it, it does say that violence brings order to chaos. Right. Well, if you've watched the news, if you can stomach it for five seconds and see what's going on in Gaza right now, that's not order. That's yep. the violence is creating the chaos. And I, I think we need also, to also creating new <laughs> and it's creating new, new enemies, new, right. new people. You, you, to, you, it's if destroy Hamas, even if they did, there's just going to be another Hama, a version of Hamas that will rise up because right. you've just traumatized and brutalized people. Right. 10 so, times more than the, the, the or a hundred times more than the people you're trying to you're consider your enemy. Yeah. So one of the things that we need to do, and I think this needs to take place in popular culture, in the media, uh, and, and, you know, in literature and art is to start dismantling that myth that, re right. that violence can be redemptive. Uh, that the idea that my violence is good and your violence is bad can be dis dismantled and just say right. violence is the problem. Right. And I know, again, that's not an easy sell to people who have their backs against the wall. It's a hard sell. As the Megadeth song says, peace sells, but who's buying? Yeah, right. And we, that starts... As Thich Nhat Hanh, the uh, Zen Buddhist monk, says, that starts with me. I have to be peace in my heart. And he lived the violent experience in Vietnam. Okay. With, you know, um, and he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King Jr. because of his work with the Buddhist church in Vietnam and standing up against both, uh, I think it was the Diem regime and... Um, and the U.S. and French colonial forces. What's, what's his name? Thich Nhat Han. He okay. wrote. A, he's written a bunch of books. One of the best ones is "Living Buddha, Living Christ." I've heard of that. Absolutely that fantastic. The, we'll put that in the show uh, notes. Um, all right. Yeah. So um, we we um, the the point when you look at what we did in response to nine eleven, uh, you could it's pretty obvious that we probably made, we did make things worse. I mean, we oh, went far worse. In a, far worse. We had a 20 year presence in Afghanistan or in Iraq. And we, uh, it created more um, groups like ISIS. Uh, so this, this idea that it's going to solve the problem is just not, it's just a myth and it's just the opposite. It makes it worse, but you know, we don't see it. We have to get people to open their eyes to see historically how these things just don't work. And and I, what is it? Propaganda that we have? It, there's a lot of propaganda. You know the oh, propaganda. What? Yes. How do you overcome the propaganda? Well, I think a lot of that starts with teaching history constructively and truthfully. Mm -hmm. when, and there's a huge conservative push against teaching history right. because they don't want to dismantle those systems of oppression in our cultural context. That is white supremacy. Right. And, and capitalism is driven by white supremacy uh, because it says we're white. So we can take your resources and we can live high on the hog and you can't. Mm -hmm. And then we also have to make people aware. So when I wrote my first book, go golden, in tw uh, it came out in 2018. So the numbers that I used for the defense budget were, I think, 2017 numbers, $582 billion. Fast forward six years, it's gone up to almost $900 billion in that time. We need people to understand that economic growth and development is not a fair trade for violence and warmongering. And they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're inextricably linked. Think about uh, the history of the 20th century. We were in a huge depression and then World War II, the defense ramp up, that made it, the American economy boom for the next however many years. So we've got to come up with an economy that is both sustainable 
uh, ecologically for the biosphere and from a humanitarian aspect. And that means we don't build bombs anymore. We don't engage in arms deals. Uh, we give guns to the Taliban to fight Russia. And then we give guns to the Taliban's enemies when it suits us. We play right. both sides against the middle all the time in the United with, with the U S war right. policy. So those kind of things, and that's awareness. How many people even know in America, how much the defense budget is? Yeah. So Probably say that again, how many. much is it? How much is the defense budget annually? It's close to 900 billion. I think it was like yeah. $878 billion every year, right? Every year. And every year, both sides of the aisle votes for that nonsense. Mm -hmm. yep. It's obscene. Yep. So when somebody says, well, don't tell me there's no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. Yes, there are certain differences, but in some ways they are radically the same. Yeah, On this, on this thing, the they same. are the same. Yeah, there's very yeah. little difference between and, them. And they're the same on foreign policy and also maintaining the United States role as a superpower. Mm -hmm. Well, you can only be a superpower if you have haves and have nots. Yeah. And that's not the way of Jesus. Right. Well, this has been fascinating, Dylan. Thank you so much for joining us here. Um, where can people find your book or a website that you have? Um, I have a I have a blog. Uh, it's called TattooTheologian.com. There is a dash between tattoo, tattoo and theologian. theologian .com. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Check that I'm, out. On, I'm on Twitter at Cruise Control 72. I'm on Facebook. I uh, just Google we'll, my name. We'll, yeah. We'll put it and in the show notes. My book is found on Am all my books are found on Amazon. Right. Okay. And the book, the most recent book is um, uh, Theological Musings. Collected essays of a tattooed theologian. So uh, Dylan, volume one. what's that? That's volume oh, one. Volume one. We have another yeah, one so coming out. So volume when, when volume, is volume two, two is coming out. Uh, comes out sometime early in 2023, and I guarantee no, you, it's going to piss off 20, some people. Or 2024, yeah. And, and you it's guarantee gonna what? Off. It's going to piss oh. some people off because there's oh, a lot wow. of deconstruction of whiteness in that in that okay all part. right all right well that's something to look forward to uh dylan thank you for your courage and your service and i mean i don't mean service in the military i mean service and what you're doing now we I, really appreciate it and, i hear that uh, thank you. so folks uh, uh thank you for listening and check out dylan's book and his work and uh i'll put stuff in the show notes and until next time Enjoy responsibly. Okay.